The Age of Jackson, 1824 to 1844. So I recommend uh, you take notes for each subsection. The era marked by the emergence of popular politics in the 1820s and the presidency of Andrew Jackson is often called the Age of Common Man or the Age or Era of Jacksonian Democracy. Historians debate whether Jackson was a major molder of, of events, a political opportunist, exploiting the democratic ferment of the times, or merely a symbol of the era. Nevertheless, the era of Jackson's name seems permanently linked. So Andrew Jackson, very controversial presidency. Uh, is he a common man, or um, was he a political opportunist? The changing politics of the J uh, Jacksonian years parallel complex and social economic changes. So the rise of a democratic society. Visitors to the United States in the 1830s, such as Alexis, Alexis de Tocqueville, a young French aristocrat, were amazed by the informal manners and democratic, democratic attitudes of Americans. In hotels, under the American plan, men and women from all classes ate together and at common tables. On stagecoaches, steamboats, and later railroads, there was also only one class of passengers, so that the rich and poor alike sat together in the same compartments. European visitors could not distinguish between classes in the United States. Men of all backgrounds wore simple dark trousers and jackets, while less well to do women emulated the fanciful, confining styles illustrated in the wide circulation uh, magazines like Gotti's Ladies Book. Equality was becoming the governing principle of American society. So there was a lot more equality in America during this time compared to the French. In fact, Alexis de Tocqueville kind of talks about this uh, that America was a true democracy. Among the white majority in American society, people shared a belief in the principle of equality or precisely, equality of opportunity for white males. These beliefs ignored the oppression of enslaved African Americans and discrimination against free blacks. Equality of the opportunity would, at least in theory, allow a young man of humble or origins to rise as far as his natural talent and industry would take him. The hero of the old age was a self-made man. There was no equivalent belief in the self-made woman, but by the end of the 1840s, feminists would take up the theme of equal rights and insist that it would be applied to both working men and women, or just both women and men. So uh, what the quad kind of talks about here is, of course, only applies to white men, right, that uh, there should be equality amongst the white men, right? But African Americans and women were not mentioned in this discussion. Politics of the common man. Between 1824 and 1840, 1824 and 1840, politics moved to the fine homes of rich southern planters and northern merchants who had dominated government in past eras in middle and lower class homes. Several factors contributed to the spread of democracy, including new suffrage laws, changes in political parties and campaigns, improved education, and increases in newspaper circulation. So people are calling for a universal male suffrage, and the cause of this is more education, uh, as well as increased political circulation, changes in parties. Universal male suffrage. The Western states, newly admitted to the Union, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri, adopted state constitutions that allowed all white men to hold office, uh, to vote and hold office. Uh, these newer constitutions omitted any religious or property qualifications for voting. Most Eastern states soon followed suit, eliminating such restrictions. As a result, through the voting, all white males could vote regardless of their social class or religion. Voting for President rose from 350,000 in 1824 to more than 2.4 million in 1840, a nearly sevenfold increase in just 16 years, uh, mostly as a result of the change in voting laws. In addition, political offices could be held by the people in the lower and middle ranks of society. So at this point, there's more political freedom. You no longer had to own property, you just had to be white in order to vote. Party nominating conventions. In the past, candidates, would, candidates for office had commonly been nominated by either state legislators or by King Caucus, a closed-door meeting in the political parties, leaders, and Congress. Common citizens had no opportunity to participate. In the 1830s, however, caucuses were uh, replaced by nominating conventions. Party politicians and voters would gather in large meeting hall to nominate the party's candidates. The anti-Masonic party was the first to hold such a nominating convention. This new method was uh, more, more open to public, popular participation, hence more democratic. So um, party naming conventions where you'd have people that would meet in large meetings to pick your candidates, this would give people a little bit more participation. In a popular election, in the presidential election of 1832, and only South Carolina used the old system in which the state legislator would choose the electors for the president. All their states had adopted a more democratic method of allowing voters to choose a state's slate of presidential electors. The two-party system. 
uh, the popular election of the presidential electors and, in fact, the president had important consequences for the two-party system. Campaigns for presidents now had to be conducted on a national scale. To organize these campaigns, candidates needed large political parties. So we're getting a two-party system compared to the era of good feelings and only just one party. Third parties. <clears throat> While only a large national parties, uh, the Democrats and the Whigs, could hope to win the presidency, uh, other political entities also merged. Merged. The Anti-Masonic Party and the Working Men's Party, for example, reached out to groups of people who had previously had shown little interest in politics. The Anti-Masons attacked the secret societies of the Masons and accused them of belonging to privileged anti-democratic elite. So you're getting these smaller groups uh, that are starting to formulate, such as the Masons, the Anti-Masons that were against the elite that they felt were part of a secret society. During the Jacksonian era, a much larger number of states and local policies were elected to office. Instead of being appointed in the past, the changes gave the voters more office in their government and also tended to increase their incre- their interest in participating, participating elections. So during Jackson's era, uh, you're getting uh, more state and local officials. Political campaigning, popular campaigning. campaigning. Candidates for office directed their campaigns and their interests and prejudices of common people. Politics also became a form of local entertainment. Campaigns of the 1830s and 1840s featured parades, floats, and marching bands and large rallies in which voters were treated to free food and drink. <coughs> the negative sides of the new campaign techniques were that and appealing to the masses. Candidates would often resort to personal attacks, ignore the issues. Politicians, for example, might attack an opponent's uh, Aristotic heirs and make him more unfriendly to common man. So you're getting that mudslinging that existed. You're getting dirty elections when they would uh, attack each other and try to embarrass each other into the public. Spoil system and rotation of office holders. Winning the government jobs became the likely the lifeblood of party organizations. At the national level, President Jackson believed in appointing people to federal jobs, which is a spoil system. Strictly according to whether they had actively campaigned for the Democratic Party. Any previous holder of office who was not a Democrat was fired and replaced with a loyal Democrat. The practice of dispensing government jobs in return for party loyalty was called a spoil system because of a comment in the war, Victor sees the spoils. So basically what Jackson would do is he would clean the White House. Anyone that was not part of his political party, he would fire and put someone that supported him even if they weren't necessarily the most educated. In addition, the Jackson believed in a system of rotation of office. By limiting a person to one term in office, he could appoint uh, some other deserving Democrat in his place. Jackson defended the replacement and rotation of office as democratic reform. No man, he said, has any um, more in- intrinsic claim to office than another. But the spoil system and the rotation of office aff- affirmed the democratic ideal that one man was as good as another. And that ordinary, Americans were capable of holding any government office. These beliefs also helped build a strong two-party system. So Jackson is basically a rotating office to allow people more chances to have participation in office. Jackson versus Adams. Political change in the Jacksonian era began several years before Jackson moved into the White House. In the controversial election in 1824, Jackson won more popular votes than the other candidate by losing elections. So 1824, a very important election. Jackson wins the popular vote but loses the electoral vote. He would call this the corrupt bargain. Election of 1824. Uh, recall the brief of era good feelings that characterized U.S. politics during the two-term presidency of James Monroe. The era ended in political bad feelings, uh, the year of bitterly contested and divisive political presidential election. By then, the old Congressional Caucus for choosing presidential candidates had broken down. As a result, four candidates of the Democratic Republican Party of Jefferson campaigned for the presidency. John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson. Among voters in the states, that kind of popular votes, Jackson won. So Jackson wins a popular vote, as I stated. But because the vote was split in four ways, he lacked a majority. So therefore, the House of Representatives had to choose a president from among the top three candidates. Uh, Henry Clay uses influence in the House to provide John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts with enough votes to win the election. The president appointed Clay his secretary of state. Jackson and his followers charged that the, decisive, the decision of voters had been foiled by a secret political maneuver called the corrupt bargain. So basically, um, there was no majority of electoral college votes. Goes to the House of Reps. They get to vote on it. Clay advocates for Quincy Adams. Quincy Adams, when he wins, makes Clay his Secretary of State. So supporters of Jackson would call this corrupt. President John Quincy Adams 
Hence further alienated the followers of Jackson when he asked Congress for money for internal improvements, aid to manufacturing, and even National University and Astronomical Observatory. Jackson viewed all these measures as a waste of money and a violation of the Constitution. Most significantly, in 1828, Congress patched together a new tariff law, which uh, generally satisfied northern manufactured but alienated southern planners. So there's announced this a tariff abomination. So, of course, he's... Uh, people don't like John Quincy Adams. One of the things that he does, he increases tariffs. People call us a tariff abominations. Um, you know, so they, they felt like he was spending his money on things that weren't necessary. Revolution of 1828. Adams sought re-election in 28, but the Jacksonians were now ready to use the discontent of Southerners and Westerners and the new campaign tactics of party organization to sweep old Hickory Jackson, as they called them, in office. Uh, going beyond parades and barbecues, Jackson's party resorted to smearing the president and accusing Jackson's wife, or sorry, Adams' wife, of being born out of wedlock. Supporters of Adams retaliated in kind, accusing Jackson's wife of adultery. The mudslinging campaign attracted a lot of interest in voter turnout sores. So you're getting a lot of ugly campaigning here. Jackson won handily, carrying every state of the Appalachians. His reputation as a war hero and the man of Western Frontier counted his victory more than positions he took on issues that day. Jackson wins the election because of he's a war hero in 1812, but as well as he represents the common man. Um, yeah. Presidency of Andrew Jackson. Jackson was a different kind of president from many of his predecessors. A strong leader, he not only dominated politics for eight years, but also became a symbol of the working class and middle class. Born in a frontier cabin, Jackson gained fame as an Indian fighter and was also a hero of Battle of New Orleans and came to live in a fine mansion in Tennessee as a wealthy planter and slave owner. But he never lost the rough manners of the frontier. He chewed tobacco, fought several duels, and displayed a violent temper. Jackson was the first president since Washington to be without a college education. In the phrase, he could be described as an extraordinary, extraordinary, ordinary man. This self-man made a living legend. This self-made man, a living legend, drew support from every social group and every section of the country. So a lot of people liked him. They felt like he represented the common man. He wasn't part of the elite. Um, yeah. But he was also a lot different. He was a lot more rugged. Presidential to power. Jackson presented himself as a representative of all the people and protector of the common man against abuse by the power of the rich and privileged. Uh, so remember, he was favored a lot by the South and the Western frontierists. He was a frugal Jeffersonian who opposed increased in federal spending and in national debt. Jackson interpreted the powers of Congress narrowly and therefore vetoed more bills. Twelve um, than all six presidents combined. Right? So he's vetoing a lot. For example, he vetoed the use of federal money to construct Maryland Maysville Road because it was wholly within one state, Kentucky, the home state of Jackson's rival, Henry Clay. So he was against the American system. Jackson's close advisors were a group known as the Kitchen Cabinet, who did not belong in his official cabinet. Because of them, the, the appointed cabinet had less influence on policy than other earlier presidents. So a couple of things, he vetoes a lot. A lot of people felt as if the executive branch was getting more power. Peggy Eden affair. Champion the common man also went on to aid uh, to the aid of common women, at least in the, in the case of Peggy O'Neill Eden. The wife of Jackson's Secretary of War, she was the target of malicious gossip by other cabinet wives, such as Jackson's recently deceased wife had been in the 1828 campaign. When Jackson tried to force the cabinet wives to accept Peggy Eden socially, most of the cabinet resigned. This controversy, controversy contributed to the resignation of Jackson's vice president, John T. Calhoun, a year later. For the remaining loyal during the crisis, Martin Van Buren of New York was chosen as vice president for Jackson's second term. So a couple of things you want to make sure you know, the Indian Removal Act. Jackson's concept of democracy did not extend to American Indians. Jackson sympathized with land-hungry citizens who were impatient to take over land by American Indians. That's why the Westerners supported them. Jackson thought uh, the most humane solution was to compel American Indians to leave their traditional homelands and resettle west of the Mississippi. So Jackson asked them to leave. In 1830, he signed the law, the Indian Removal Act, which forced the resettlement of many thousands of American Indians. By 1835, most eastern tribes had reluctantly compiled and moved west. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was created in 1836. So he might move west, and he also creates a Bureau of Indian Affairs to deal with all issues dealing with the Native Americans. Most politicians supported the policy of Indian removal, Georgia, and other states. Passed laws requiring the Cherokees migrate to the west. When Cherokees challenged Georgia, in courts, Supreme Court ruled in Cherokee v. Georgia that Cherokees were not a foreign nation with the right to sue in federal court. When the second case, Worcester v. Georgia, the high court ruled that the laws of Georgia had no force within the Cherokee territory. 
In this clash between the state's laws and federal courts, Jackson sided with the states. The court was powerless to enforce its decision without president's support. So although the Supreme Court rules, the Cherokee just could stay in Georgia, um, it's up to Jackson to enforce it, and he chooses not to. So you need to know what the Trail of Tears is. Uh, the most Cherokees uh, repudiated the settlement of 1835, which provided land in the provide land in Indian Territory. In 1838, after Jackson had left the office, the U.S. Army forced 15,000 Cherokees to leave Georgia. The hardship of the Trail of Tears caused the death of 4,000. So that's the, move, the movement of the Cherokee Indians westward. Jackson nullification. Jackson favored state rights, but not this union. In 1828, the South American legislature decreased the tariff of 1828, the so-called tariff of abominations. To be constitutional in doing so, it affirmed the theory advanced by Jackson's first president, John C. Calhoun. According to this nullification theory, each state had the right to decide whether or not the federal law declared null and void. So, remember Kentucky, Virginia resolutions um, with John Adams. Uh, they ruled that they would not follow the Alien Sedition Acts because it was constitutional or unconstitutional. What Calhoun is doing here is saying they have the right to nullify, meaning not follow the tariff of abominations, right? So we'll see what happens. Jackson's not going to be too happy about that. In 1830, Daniel Webster in Massachusetts debated Robert Hayne of South Carolina the nature of the Federal Union or the Constitution. Webster attacked the idea that any state could defy or leave the Union. Following this famous Webster Hain debate, President Jackson declared his own position in toast and he presented a political dinner. Our federal union, he declared, it must be preserved. Calhoun responded immediately with another host, toast, the union next to our liberties most dear. So Jackson is calling for this uh, union, of course, the importance of the union. Sorry. So Jackson, of course, is calling for the union. So I apologize for that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, what ends up happening is, of course, uh, Jackson is then saying that nullification is not allowed, uh, which means they can't defy the law. In 1832, Cal Calhoun State, South Carolina, increased tension by holding a special convention to nullify both the hated 1828 tariff and the new tariff of 1832. The convention passed a resolution forbidding the collection of tariffs within the state. Uh, Jackson reacted decisively. He told the Secretary of War to prepare for military action. He persuaded Congress to pass a force bill giving him authority to act against South Carolina. Jackson also issued a proclamation to the people of South Carolina stating that the nullification and disunion would be treason. So Jackson goes ahead. He tries to pass a force bill. He does pass a force bill. which states South Carolina must follow that new tariff, right? And he's thinking about bringing federal troops to go out and do that. So we're almost getting a civil war here. Federal troops did not march in a crisis. Jackson opened the door for a compromise, suggesting that Congress lower the tariff. South Carolina proposed nullification and later formally um, postponed nullification and later formally rescinded it after Congress enacted a new tariff. So the president will then just go ahead and, of course, lower the tariff, which prevents a war from happening. Jackson's strong defense of federal authority forced the militant and advocates of states' rights to retreat. Another issue, however, militant Southerners had uh, Jackson's support. The uh, president shared South's alarm when, about the growing anti-slavery movie in the North. He used his executive power to stop anti-slavery literature from being sent through the U.S. mail. Southern Jacksonians trusted that Jackson could not extend democracy to African Americans. So, um, yeah, so he, yeah, of course, is some people are saying he's expanding his federal power here. Um, but the nullification crisis is one that you want to make sure that you know for the for your exam, um, and at the, at the same time, uh, Jackson also supports, uh, of course, uh, the view of uh, he supports slavery, right? I mean, he doesn't necessarily deal with this issue um, uh, in front, but he is supporting the stopping of anti-slavery literature being sent through the mail. Another major issue of Jackson's presidency uh, concerned the recharting of the Bank of the United States. The bank and its branches, although privately owned, received federal deposits and attempted to serve a public purpose of the cushioning of the ups and downs of the national economy. The bank's president, Nicholas Biddle, managed to, it effectively. Biddle arrogance, however, contributed to the supervision with the bank, abused its power, and served the interests of the wealthy. Jackson shared his suspicion. He believed the Bank of the United States was unconstitutional. So the... Um, Jackson's against the bank because he feels like it only benefited the wealthy. Henry Clay, Jackson's chief political opponent, favored the bank. In 1832, in election year, Clay decided to challenge Jackson on the bank issue by permitting persuading a majority of Congress to bank, pass a bank recharter bill. 
Jackson promptly vetoed this bill, denouncing it as a private monopoly, then enriched, enriched the wealthy and uh, the, out, the foreigners at the expense of the common people and the hydra of corruption. The voters agree with Jackson. Jackson won re-election with more than three-fourths electoral votes. So um, what uh, Clay is, of course, and so is Biddle, they're for the National Bank, and they try to get this bank rechartered early because they think that Jackson, the people will be against Jackson for it because he's gaining too much power. However, they were wrong, and as a result of this, the bank kind of loses a lot of its federal power. The two-party system. The one-party system had characterized Monroe presidency, had given way to a two-party system under Jackson. Supporters of Jackson were known as Democrats. White supporters of this leading rival were called Whigs. While supporters of his leading rival, Henry Clay, were called Whigs. The Democratic Party harked back into the old Republican Party of Jackson, and the Whig Party resembled that of the Federalist Party of Hamilton. At the same time, the new parties reflected the challenge conditions of the Jacksonian era. Democrats and Whigs alike were challenged to respond to the relentless westward expansion of the nation and emergence of industrial economy. So one of the issues, of course, we're having to deal with is Western um, expansion. And that's basically saying is that both parties, now we have two-party system again and represent many of the same views as the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Jackson's second term. After winning election 32, uh, he moved to destroy the Bank of the United States. The first thing he does is he sets up pet banks. Jackson attacked the bank by withdrawing all federal funds. Aided by Treasury John Roger Taney, he transferred the funds to various state banks, which Jackson called, Jackson critics called pet banks. So he went ahead and he established more power of the state banks. Species circular. Uh, as a result of both Jackson's financial policies and feverish speculation in Western lands, prices for land and various goods became badly inflated. Jackson hoped to check the infl infl inflationary trend by using a presidential, presidential order known as the Species Circular. It required that all future purchases of future federal lands be made in specie or gold and silver rather than in paper banknotes. Soon afterward, banknotes lost their value and land sales plummeted. Right after Jackson left office, the financial crisis, the Panic of 1837, plunged a nation's economy into depression. This is a huge failure of the Jackson presidency. One of the things that he wants to do is he wants to uh, – he, because one of the things that was happening was uh, speculation in Western lands had become badly inflated, meaning that this, the investments in Western land weren't happening. So he's basically saying, hey, just buy it by gold or silver. This is a huge fail and leads to the Panic of 1837. Election of 1836, following the two-term tradition of his predecessors, Jackson did not seek a third term. To, mark, uh, to make sure his policies were carried out in his retirement, he persuaded his running mate, or his vice president, Martin Van Buren, uh, to run. Fearing defeat, the Whig Party adopted the unusual strategy of nominating three candidates from three different regions. In doing so, the Whigs hoped to throw the election into the House of Representatives, where each state had one vote in the selection of the president. The Whig strategy failed, however, as Van Buren took 58% of the vote. So the Whig Party tries to get all strategic, bring in three members, and hope that no one gets the majority and then the House would decide on it. Well, it's a fail. Van Buren wins. Martin Van Buren, Panic of 1837. Just as Van Buren took office, the country suffered a financial panic as uh, one bank after another closed its door. Jackson's opposition to the recharting of the Bank of the United States was only one of the main causes of the economic depression. So one thing is the National Bank isn't there to provide any stability. But the Whigs were quick to blame for the Democrats for the laissez-faire economic. The Whigs were quick to blame the Democrats for the laissez-faire economics, which advocated for little federal involvement in the economy. Yeah. So a lot of this depression could be because there is not much federal involvement. Yeah, that's what the Whigs are saying. The Log Cabin and Hard Cider Campaign of 1840. In election 1840, the Whigs were in a strong opposition to defeat Van Buren and Jacksonian Democrats. Voters were unhappy with the bad state of the economy. In addition, the Whigs were better uh, organized with Democrats and had a popular hero, William Henry Harrison, as their presidential candidate. The Whigs took campaign in Hoopla and New Heights. To symbolize Harrison's humble organs, origins, sorry, they put log cabins on wheels and parade them down the streets and in through cities and towns. They also passed out hard cider for voters to drink and bottoms and hats to wear. And name calling is propaganda device also marked the 1840 campaign. The Whigs attacked Martin Van Buren as an aristocrat with a taste for foreign wines. So a lot of mudslinging going on. Uh, William Henry Harrison is a candidate of the Whigs to go against Van Buren. 
A remarkable, a remarkable 78% of eligible voters cast their ballots for Old Tippecanoe. He's a war hero. And John Tyler of Virginia, a former states' rights Democrat who joined the Whigs, took 53% of the popular vote, the, uh, most of the election, in uh, electoral votes in all three sections. This election established Whigs and national parties. The Whigs win. However, one of the biggest issues that happened is Harrison dies of pneumonia less than a month after taking office. And his excellency, John Taylor, or John Tyler, became the first president to succeed the vice president to, to succeed the president. President Taylor was not much of a Whig. He vetoed the Whigs' national big bank bills and other legislation and favored, favored Southern and expansionist Democrats during the balance of his term. Um, the Jacksonian era was in the last stage and came to an end with the Mexican War and also the issue of slavery. So uh, the Whigs end up winning. However, they're not really winning because William Henry Harrison dies in pneumonia. And then you're getting John Tyler, who is a Whig, but secretly he's also a Democrat. Uh, so the Whig that don't really necessarily get the things that they want. So let's take a look at this. So we definitely went over here. Universal man manhood suffrage, all men under the age of, or sorry, just now all of a sudden people, met white men that don't own property do have now have the right to vote. Calhoun, slavery. Uh, so one thing that you want to look about Calhoun is a tariff of abominations, right? Uh, he uh, is against the tariff, and he goes ahead and he wants to nullify. He portrays uh, uh, Andrew Jackson as King Andrew specifically because of all the vetoes of Congress. Uh, you also want to make sure you know the bank war is Andrew Jackson, of course. Um, he ends up closing the federal bank, and he establishes smaller pet banks because he believes the federal bank it only benefits the rich and the wealthy. The Indian Removal Act, of course, he goes ahead and moves uh, the Cherokee Nation to the west. Um, even though Worcester versus Georgia ruled that they could stay there, right? Uh, so those are some of the main things that we want to make sure you understand. Uh, I did cover everything in that reading in your study guide, so make sure that you go back and just fill in that notes section.